Hello folks, I'm Rob Machado for the Air Safety Institute. Many years ago, famed psychologist Abraham Maslow suggested that if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And that's why it's always best to have a versatile and effective teaching strategy available to you when introducing any new subject to your students. So let me share with you one of the most effective teaching strategies that I've used over the years to help students learn. It's a five-step strategy, and I guarantee if you use it to introduce any new cognitive, perceptual, or motor behavior to your students, you'll be pleased with the result. So let's begin with, hmm, Pope Julius II. When the Pope decided on a room upgrade for his Sistine Chapel, my guess is that he introduced Michelangelo to the massive project by saying, Mikey, let's talk about the big picture of all the little pictures I want you to paint up there. And this is a, a very wise strategy, I think, because 80% of us pick up new subjects quicker when someone lays out just what it is that we're about to learn. In other words, lays out the big picture, followed by all the tiny little details and specifics. Not doing so is like giving someone a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and insisting that they assemble the picture without telling them what the picture is. And what fun is that? Well, <laughs> not too much fun for the person trying to assemble the picture. That's why step one of this five step teaching process is describe the big picture for your student. If your lesson is on slow flight, then explain the value of learning to fly an airplane slow. And this is a skill that a student needs to land an airplane, right? Of course it is. If your lesson is on steep turns, then explain to your student how this maneuver helps him or her understand that an airplane stall speed can actually rise up to meet the airplane instead of the airplane slowing down to meet the stall speed. If you're teaching a course on weather, then describe how uneven heat distribution is responsible for nearly every aspect of weather in our atmosphere. Now that is thinking big. Perhaps Gary Zukav explained the idea of the big picture best in his book, The Dancing Wu Li Masters, a book on quantum physics. In the introduction, Gary wrote, the master begins from the center and not from the fringe. He imparts an understanding of the basic principles of the art before going on to the meticulous details. The master does not speak of gravity until the student stands in wonder at the flower petal falling to the ground. Once you've displayed the big picture, it's time to talk directly to the doing portion of your student's brain. So, Step two is define your objectives in behavioral terms. Telling your student that he needs to use more right rudder when entering a right turn is, well, asking him to measure without a ruler. More than what? How much more? You're better off defining your objectives in behavioral terms such as, Bob, to enter a right turn, press the ball of your right foot on the bottom of the right rudder pedal sufficiently to keep the nose from yawing to the left during the turn entry. You see, now you've given him a ruler. He understands the specific behavior you want because you've spoken directly to the action center of his brain. Defining objectives behaviorally is useful, but only if you have behaviors to describe. Your job as a flight instructor is to provide the experience leading to the development of new behaviors. Unfortunately, some experiences are just plain hard to come by and must be artificially created. That's why flight instructors will, in flight, reduce the power to flight idle, look over at their student and say, Bob, your engine has failed. Of course, some students will counter this with, no it didn't, look, somebody pull back the throttle. Well, they just don't get that you're trying to simulate experience when the real thing isn't available. So, step three is simulate experience. For example, if you want your student to see what an aerodynamic slug an airplane becomes when loaded with ice, you might say something like, Bob, starting now, I'll reduce the RPM by 100 for every passing minute to simulate a high rate of ice accretion on the wings while you find us a place to land. Now that is simulating an experience that can't be had directly. If after five minutes of your shenanigans the student shoves the throttle in, however, you'll know that he has just discovered how to simulate de-icing boots. 
Unfortunately, there's often a big difference between how we teach a maneuver and what we really do ourselves. For instance, you might teach your students to look at the runway directly over the nose during the landing flare, and that's fine until the nose comes up and the runway suddenly disappears. If you were to share the strategy that you, as an experienced instructor, really use when flaring an airplane, you'd probably say something like, Bob, look at the runway and the horizon over the nose until the nose obstructs your view of the runway. Then, shift your vision to the left slightly to keep the runway in sight. And this is why step four of this five-step process says, identify the specific clues you use to perform a behavior and share these with your student. In other words, teach the student what you do. Don't keep the good stuff a secret. Finally, it's important to remember that even if your students dress up like stoic Vulcans and make regular appearances at Star Trek conventions, they're still human. Unless, of course, those pointy ears are real. <laughs> and that means they have feelings that you must respect. That's why step five says, critique the behavior and not the student. And the best way to do this is to avoid using the word you in your critique, speaking only to the behavior in need of improvement. For instance, assume that a strong crosswind keeps blowing your student across the international date line while flying the traffic patterns downwind leg. You could say something like, Bob, it's as if your brain has become disconnected from its plug. You need to man up by making less wimpy crosswind corrections today, not tomorrow. The date line. Instead of inspiring better behaviors, you've summoned your students' most powerful defense mechanisms. You see, critiquing the performance and not the student means saying something such as, Bob, to maintain a parallel track with the runway under these wind conditions requires twice the wind correction previously used. And that should make him happy, and that should make you happy today. Folks, I sure hope you find this pocket-ready, five-step teaching strategy useful when introducing any new subject to your students. My name is Rob Machado for the Air Safety Institute.